When I was very young, I learned a song that went along with that scripture passage, and perhaps you may have learned that song as, as well. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. That's right. You guys are awesome. That is, a, that is a song that helps teach us a story of the scriptures. It's one of any number of songs that help teach us who God is calling us to be. As you know, as Methodists, music and lyrics is one of the primary ways that we help teach our faith, help us understand the stories of scripture. And the story of Zacchaeus helps make a connection between our salvation and our finances. It is a story that's easy to tell. It's colorful to remember. It has a catchy song that goes along with it, but it can be at least slightly challenging when we pay attention to what it's inviting us to consider. Because in some ways, we are all Zacchaeus. John Wesley, the Christian evangelist and founder of the Methodist movement, gave a remarkable sermon entitled The Use of Money. While he gave that message several hundred years ago, the message that at its heart contains advice that still rings true today. Wesley invites us to earn all that we can, to save all you can, and to give all you can. This message series and today's sermon has been adapted from that sermon from John Wesley and by the book by Jim Harnish about that sermon. And two weeks ago, we examined John Wesley's advice to earn all you can as a person of faith. Because sometimes we separate what we do for a living, what we might do for an employment, and our spiritual life. And Wesley encourages us to keep them connected and that when we're earning all that we can, to do so with honest labor, through common sense, and without paying more than it's worth in our body or our souls. Last week, we focused on what it means to be a good steward while considering two different examples of what it means to save all you can. How we manage your finances can bring us closer to or further away from God. And good financial stewardship helps us grow closer to Christ. Now today, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to share a little bit about Zacchaeus' story, and we heard the gospel passage from Zacchaeus. He was a small man, a man of small in stature, but he had a big bank account. He was very wealthy. You see, he was a chief tax collector. He profited, you remember, in that time from a corrupt economic system. In the role that he was in at that time, he collected ever-increasing taxes for the Roman Empire. And he likely kept a generous percentage of those taxes for himself. As a result, he was despised as a sinner. He was rejected by his own people, the people of Israel. He was unwelcome to the place of worship, unwelcome in the synagogue. And have you ever wondered why it was exactly that Zacchaeus climbed up into the tree to try to get a look at Jesus? How, how had he even heard of Jesus? Now, I believe that Luke may have given us a clue earlier in his gospel when we're reading in chapter 5, verse 29, where it reads this. Then Levi threw a great banquet for Jesus in his home. A large number of tax collectors and others sat down to eat with them. Now, Levi, also known as Matthew, was another tax collector. He was doing the very same thing that Zacchaeus was doing. He threw a dinner party to introduce his friends to Jesus. And we certainly don't know this for sure, but I like to imagine that Zacchaeus was in that crowd. And if Zacchaeus was indeed at that dinner table with Jesus, he might have experienced something that he had never known before. Perhaps he would have felt accepted by Jesus in a way that his peers, his colleagues, his community didn't accept him and a love of God that, that was brand new for him. Perhaps glimpsing a life that was more than just grabbing all the money that he could get. Perhaps he may have realized that all his wealth could never buy the life that he most deeply desired. Perhaps he became convinced that there was a higher calling for the way that he used his money. And then when Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, he may have also been listening to the prediction that Jesus had shared that, that when he gets to Jerusalem, that he was going to be put to death. This may have been Zacchaeus' last chance to see Jesus. Maybe this is why he is so eager to see him. So there he was, willing to sacrifice his pride and dignity by hanging on for dear life in the branches of that sycamore tree. He must have looked foolish, especially to those that would have known him. I suspect he nearly fell off the limb when uh, Jesus called him by name, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. 
Now, it's probably an understatement when Luke says that Zacchaeus was happy to welcome Jesus. He was probably overwhelmingly overjoyed to welcome Jesus. But it was also perhaps no understatement for Luke to record that everyone else grumbled about this idea, the idea that Jesus was hanging out with a blatant sinner like Zacchaeus. Now, in response to this unexpected, undeserved, unearned grace of God and Jesus Christ, Zacchaeus blurts out a response that that we're not expecting. Wow, is it the only way that I know how to say thank you is to give half of my wealth to the poor and pay back the folks I've cheated four times over. And Jesus said, now that is what salvation looks like. Let's have a party. Zacchaeus' witness underscores the profound reality that salvation is not merely a spiritual experience that prepares us for life after we die. Salvation is the way that God transforms every area of our life so that we can become a part of God's saving work in this world. Salvation changes our hearts by changing the fundamental orientation of our living, including the way that we use our money. It sets us free from bondage bondage to narrow self-interest, and it opens up our lives to the way that the Spirit of God might be at work through us in the lives of other people. Salvation is, of course, about a lot more than money, but it is never about anything less than money. This reality is particularly true in our culture that's driven by the power of money. We live in a place, in a time, in a, in a, in a country where money has the incredible ability to be used as a blessing or as a curse. Money can be a gracious gift that we manage for God's sake, or perhaps it can be a demonic tyrant that controls us for its own sake. Now, Zacchaeus didn't earn forgiveness and a relationship with God by giving. His newfound generosity was his response to the extravagant generosity of God. But salvation perhaps never would have become a reality for Zacchaeus without the change in his life. He moves from being consumed with gaining and saving into a life that's energized by giving. We find another story, of course, that sets the example for giving all that we can when we look elsewhere in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Looking up, Jesus saw rich people throwing their gifts into the collection box for the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow throw in two small copper coins worth a penny. He said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than them all. All of them are giving out of their spare change, but she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had to live on. Now, it seemed in this other time and place that Jesus was doing some pretty intense people watching in the temple. You remember that at that time there were 13 large metal trumpet-shaped containers that lined the courtyard of the temple. And there was no paper money at the time either. So if you can imagine that when a, rich, when a, a r- generous gift was made, uh, a significant gift was dropped into the container, it made an incredible noise. You could hear it rattle all the way to the bottom. And Jesus watched and heard the way that the rich gave their gifts, throwing in lots of money, it says in Mark of the same story. And then he noticed an anonymous widow who dropped in two tiny coins into the offering. The original text says that the coins were a lepta. This was the most minor of Greek coins of the day, less worth than a penny. They were so small that you probably couldn't hear a sound when they hit the bottom of the container. Clearly, Jesus had a different way of counting the offering on that day. He estimated it based not on its size, but on the impact that the gift made on the giver. He saw the gift not on the amount that it added to the temple treasury, but on the effect in the giver's life. His interpretation was based not on how much people gave, but on how much they had left over afterwards, not based on other people's offerings, but on the giver's capacity, based on the transformation that it represented in the life of the one who gives. Jesus counts our offerings, counts our commitments not based on the size or the amount, but on the impact on our souls. I believe that Jesus looks at our giving based on not how much we give, but on how our life is changed in the act of giving. In the very same way, John Wesley was clear that earning 
and saving are not ends in themselves. They lead toward what Wesley would say is called the farther end of giving. Wesley acknowledged that when it comes to making the best use of money, faithful people often don't employ it to the greatest advantage. In all of his sermons that Wesley would preach on, uh, on money, he affirmed the importance pro- of providing for personal and family needs. And because he was engaged with the very poorest of the poor in his day, he knew that there was no inherent goodness in poverty. Life is better when we have what Wesley called things needful for yourself, for your wife, for your children, for your servants, for any others who pertain to your household. Wesley was equally clear that simply earning and saving can, in fact, become a a barrier, can get in the way of going on to perfection as a follower of Christ. That is, unless these practices become how we move toward the act of giving, which is a Christ-centered act of generosity in which we can find joy in giving all that we can. Wesley's rules are not about raising money for the church. They're about becoming more like Jesus. His intention was to guide early Methodists in the spiritual discipline of generosity. Wesley hoped that they would become a giving people whose lives were shaped by the likeness of an extravagantly generous God, and that is our hope today. The good news is that when we respond to God's extravagant generosity for us and grow in our generosity, we become more like Christ. So I want to invite you to the joy of living generously by committing to support our 2022 ministry funding plan. Later in the worship service, those that are here in the worship center will be invited to present their 2022 ministry funding plan commitment forms during the offering. If you haven't already done so, you can find it in the pew in front of you. You can complete it and uh, bring it forward. Or you can bring it forward and, uh, and offer whatever you're able to put, even if it's zero. You can share your information there and bring it forward as an act of worship. If you're worshiping with us online... You can set up recurring giving today at our website. You can update the amount and frequency at any time, and we'll use those numbers as a commitment if you're unable to return a form in person. We also uh, have our 2022 uh, Susanna Wesley shirts. Here is uh, is what that looks like. We are going to give one away to every household that sets up a recurring online giving. And if you return a commitment card today, um, then we're going to give them to you at $10 a piece. Um, They're going to be available for everyone for $20 uh, in November, but we want to give those who make a commitment um, the first opportunity uh, to be able to receive one of these shirts. It's just a tangible sign to say thank you for giving all that you can. You can stop by the table if you're here in the worship center today, um, or you can stop by to the church office anytime during the week. Today we have the opportunity to respond to God's generous generosity for us in a very particular way. But we have the chance to respond to God's generosity throughout our lives every day. Zacchaeus' response was to climb down from the tree and to welcome Jesus into his home. The widow decided to put her gift into the offering. How will we respond to God's extravagant generosity for us today and in the days ahead? Will you pray with me? Oh God, thank you for your generosity for us, for your love that welcomes us along with all of our neighbors, for the ways that you are at work in our lives even before we recognize it, for your love that claims us and saves us from ourselves and from the power of sin, and for your grace that helps us grow always in the journey of loving you and loving our neighbor. God, we ask that you would use us to be about your work in the world And that because we're here, Shawnee County might look more like your kingdom. We offer all of ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.